just run down quickly some of what we talked about last week. I may go back and touch on a week before that. I don't really remember. But in chapters uh, 6 and 7, the coming judgment is predicted. And in chapter 8, Ezekiel, if you recall, he's given this visionary tour of the temple in Jerusalem, and he sees there this blatant idolatry that's going on in the temple in Jerusalem. In chapter 9, the, the divine executioners were summoned, and they go through, throughout the city slaughtering the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this is one of these, you know, just uh, powerful scenes there where Ezekiel just cries out as the bodies are being piled up. In chapter 10, the throne chariot of chapter 1, it reappears and an angel scatters over the city burning coals that the angel has received from the cherubim. And so this, of course, is a representation of God's purifying holiness, of his judgment. And then God's glory moves from the threshold of the temple to the east gate and it's poised to leave the city, which it does in chapter 11. Then in chapter 11, the first part of that, verses 1 through 13, Ezekiel prophesies judgment on Jerusalem's evil leaders. And in the last half of chapter 11, the future of Israel passes to the exiles, contrary to what the inhabitants of Jerusalem, how they deceived themselves into thinking that they were the future of, of Israel, that the future of Israel really lies with these scattered, weak exiles, that God and his power is going to bring them back. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 16, the exile, Judah's exile is acted out. Remember, you have a lot of this symbolic and visionary stuff with Ezekiel, and he acts out the exile. Then in chapter 12, verses 17 to 28, God makes clear that the long prophesied judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, that it would soon take place. Then in chapter 13, which is where we're going to be turning to right now, chapter 13, he prophesies against the false prophets and prophetesses. And that's where I want to go and pick up. I, want, I only have two slides, just as I've done before. I just have that map just because it kind of gives you the feeling, hey, <laughs> you know, the setting, there you go. So that'll just sit up there. But in chapter 13, now some of this, you know, I've just been talking about chunks of it, but some of us, I hope you've been reading it, because the power of it, when you see how, how it's expressed, I'm just telling you, you know, what I think it's saying and giving you my, my view of it. But when you read the words, and some of them, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, read it just to catch some of this. But in, in chapter 13... Ezekiel prophesies here against those who speak, you know, they claim to speak for the Lord, but they really don't. They're simply making stuff up, and then they're ascribing it to God. So, that, you know, they're, they're just making up their own stuff. Now, typically, they prophesy what people want to hear. Okay, this is, this is their modus operandi. They, they prophesy what people want to hear. Rather than preach the coming judgment that God is bringing on the city so that people will wake up and repent... What these false prophets and prophetesses are doing is they, they say all is well. Peace. Everything's fine. Don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. All is well. See, and instead of helping the people avoid destruction by sounding the alarm, by telling them danger is, is coming, the judgment is coming, repent, repent. Instead of doing that, they lure them into believing that there is no danger. You see that in verse 22 and a number of other places. It's, you know, they, they get them to think, oh, everything's okay. There's no concern. Judgment's not coming. We're safe and secure. And that's a terrible thing to do. He says they're like jackals in the ruins. In verse 4, they're like jackals in the ruins in that they do nothing to shore up the people's vulnerability to judgment. You know, when a city was destroyed... You'd have jackals climbing over the rubble and making little homes and dens there. So here you have these prophets there. They make themselves at home in a society that is in moral ruin. They're perfectly comfortable there. They make themselves at home there, and they do nothing to shore up the people's vulnerability to judgment. He says in verses 10 and 12, they whitewash unsound walls thus masking the inability of these walls to protect from the flood of judgment. God is bringing judgment. And here are these walls that will do nothing to withstand the judgment, and they paint them over and whitewash them to give people the impression they are secure when they're not. And in verse 18, he says that they, they hunt the lives of God's people. They hunt the lives of God's people. 
Well, today there are many people who are unwilling to sound the alarm to those who are living in sin. You know, it sounds so intolerant in our culture. It sounds so intolerant to sit here and to say, to to tell the homosexual, the drug abuser, the drunk, the adulterer, the liar, the thief, the fornicator, to tell them that judgment is coming on them. We don't like to say that. We don't like to say that. And I've told you before, I remember teaching, I don't remember where we were, but I was teaching a lesson talking about hell, judgment, something Jesus had said. And there was somebody visiting our group, and his mom told me later that he wouldn't come back because he didn't like all that, you know, whatever it was, fire and brimstone and, and that kind of stuff. And I said, well, you know, what are you going to do? You can sit and say, well, okay, no, we don't do that because that just sounds so negative and so judgmental. Well, are you really doing anything, anything for somebody when you don't tell them that God calls you to repent? When you don't tell the person living in sin that God calls you to repent and that there is no salvation if you choose to live in sin? But we don't like to do that, see, because it just, it just sounds so bad. You know, it just sounds so bad. We don't do people any favors by deceiving them. We don't do them any favors. You know, I know there's, if, if I hadn't heard and learned, that listen, you know, you have to choose. When Jesus says, I have to be the first thing in your life. You know, I have to be the top priority in your life. You have to choose. You have to love me more than anything. And if you love your illicit sexual relationship more than me, then you can't have me. If you love your drugs more than me, then you can't have me. I have to be the top thing in your life. Okay? So can people be... Of course they can, but they have to, you understand, repent. And so people who try to mask that and try to say, oh, don't, you know, don't worry about it. The Christ's call means no change in your life. You just go on living the way you are living, you'll be perfectly fine because he's a lover of all people. Well, he is a lover of all people, so much so that his son died that we can have life. But he calls us to receive that life by surrendering to Jesus Christ. Okay, so I see a lot of this going on, on today, and I, I quoted... Some weeks ago, what Paul told the Galatians in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please, please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And every time I say this, I go out of my way to let people know, does that mean that you think you don't sin? And the answer is, of course not. It means I recognize there is a difference between a genuine, bona fide surrender that is imperfectly lived out and a person who doesn't surrender and says, I'm going to keep living with my girlfriend. I'm going to keep living with her because I like it. And I don't care what he wants. I simply don't care. There's a difference. There's a difference. And here is Ezekiel saying to the people, people who deny there's a difference, people who sit here and say, listen, peace, peace, everything's fine, you don't have to worry about the coming judgment, don't worry about it, they are whitewashing, unsound walls that will not protect against the flood of judgment. And they are really enemies. You think they're friends, but they're in fact enemies. They tickle ears instead of preaching the truth because it benefits them to do so. You can see that in verse 19 where they're given food. You see, they're paid. They come and they tickle people's ears. They say what sounds nice to people because they get stuff out of it. And the same is true today. You see, the same thing is true today. We get paid for saying this kind of stuff. People compromise the truth because they get paid with what? Public acceptance. You preach this stuff about, listen, you have to repent. God calls you to come and die. You preach that. And what people, but you preach, listen, you keep living the way you want to, and that's fine. You know, that, don't, don't you worry about that, that's all fine. Well, you'll get paid, see, because the society will say, you're a deep thinker. You're broad-minded. You're nuanced. But if you come and say, God calls you to come and die, to repent, to serve Jesus Christ, heart, soul, mind, and strength, they'll say you're a toothless fundamentalist. 
You belong on a swing in Arkansas. That's what they'll say. See, so society, so people want, they don't like that. They want to be paid with acceptance. People thinking they're deep, really thoughtful. Stroke your beard, yes, well. And then wind up whitewashing a wall. Okay, and that's what's happening here. And Ezekiel is, is telling them, God is telling them, such people then, in verse 9, and you can see today, they will be condemned. Okay, it's not a noble thing. It is not a noble thing to deceive people about their future because you want them to think of you a certain way. It's not a noble thing. And we recognize that. You know, I've mentioned before this idea of tough love. We recognize tough love. Sometimes you have to tell people stuff they don't want to hear to benefit them. So see, true love is willing to risk the wrath of people, their anger, their resentment, because you're trying to bless them. You're not really loving somebody if you sit and tell them, listen, that's okay, don't you worry about that. You just keep staying there, and that's all right. No, no, there's nothing radical about the call of Christianity, no. You know, you just kind of float in and out. It's like the Rotary Club, except you get wet. <laughs> you see, that's all. Well, when you do that, you're making up your own religion, and you're not doing any good to anybody. See, you're not doing any good to anybody because Jesus says, pick Pick, you got to give it all to me. And we have to make that clear to people. We have to make that clear to people. Okay, in chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, here this idolater's false comfort is to be taken from them. And you have certain leaders here, they come to Ezekiel inquiring of the Lord. And God informs Ezekiel, he says, these are idol worshipers at heart. These people who are coming to you to inquire of me they are idol worshipers at heart, meaning they're devoted to other gods. And God instructs Ezekiel, he says, announce to them that he, God, rather than the prophet, rather than Ezekiel, he will answer such people who inquire of him. Okay, he will do it, and he'll do it in accordance with their idolatry. In other words, he will in some fashion bring about their deaths. This is in verse 8, he will cut them off. Okay, so here you have these people who are idolaters who are coming to inquire the Lord, and the Lord tells Ezekiel, he says, listen, don't you answer them. I'm going to answer them. I'm going to answer them in accordance with their idolatry. I'm going to cut them off from the people. And you, Ezekiel, you are to generally call the house of Israel to repent of their idolatry. It says that in verse 6. So he's going to, he has a ministry to call them to repent, but when these idolaters come to inquire for a word from the Lord, and we're going to see later, they actually come and want God to bless their idolatry. And he says, he says, look, when this happens, when these idolaters come to inquire, I'm going to respond to them, I will answer them. And his purpose, he says in verse 5, is to seize the hearts of the people, to turn the people from their inner idolatry, and he will do this by preventing them from finding false comfort in bogus prophets. What happens with these idolaters? They want to come to the prophets and say, listen, Give me the word that I'm okay. Bless what I'm doing. Give me a word from the Lord that I'm really okay. Well, God says, I'm going to answer them, and I'm going to kill them. What will that do? People who are in idolatry will soon stop coming for a false word of comfort. They'll go, uh-oh. And so I'm really trying to turn their hearts back by cutting off from them a false word of comfort where they'll be lied to and deceived into thinking that they're really all right when they're not. So he's going to wind up doing that to them. And toward that end, the prophets, he says, who are enticed to disobey. The prophets who are, who are going to disobey what he's saying when he says, you don't answer them, I'll answer them. The prophets who are enticed to disobey and to give false answers to the inquiries that these idolaters make when they come, he says to them that they will meet the same fate. So God will have them snared in their own wickedness. So here we have, you know, he's letting them know, and you just see the wickedness. We're going to see it more and more of what's going on, and you see how people are. Don't we sit here and we look at Israel and we say, how can you do this? How can you be this way? How? After all God has done, you just sit here and just keep thumbing him in the eye like he's a joke. And then turn around and say, he's going to bless me. Yeah, he's going to bless me. I just sit here and spit on him. I'm saying, you know, God's a chump. 
That's how we put it. We think he's a chump. And so he sits here and says, that's not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. And then in verse 14, chapter 14, verses 12 through 23, he dispels a lie that they're selling. They're selling a lie, and it seems that one of the lies on which the false prophets built their prophecies of peace, you know, they're telling the people, listen, don't worry about it. Jerusalem's cool. Nothing's going to happen. There's peace. When there is no peace, don't worry about the judgment. Everything's fine. Well, one of the lies on which they built that false claim, it looks like from this, this section, was that, that Jerusalem would be spared because of the righteous few within it. Like Jeremiah. Look, God's not going to do anything. Look, you can be sure of that. Because there are righteous people there, he's not going to judge Jerusalem. And he says in chapter 14, verses 12 through 23, you know, it, it's true that in his mercy, okay, that we, we know this from other texts, that in his mercy that he was willing to spare Sodom if there were just ten righteous people there. You see that in Genesis 18. But that's no guarantee of Jerusalem's safety. That's what he says in chapter, that's no guarantee of Jerusalem's safety. God is not precluded from judging a city in which righteous people live. He's not barred from doing that. In fact, when he decides to bring a particular judgment, even the presence of such paragons of virtue, he says, as Noah, Daniel, and Job will not spare the city. So whoever it is who's sitting here saying, don't worry about it, he's not going to judge Jerusalem. He doesn't judge where there's a righteous person. And certainly there are some righteous people here in Jerusalem. He says, that's baloney. It is true I didn't judge Sodom. Although I don't know if he says that in that text, but we know that that's true, that he didn't judge Sodom. But his point is, he says, listen, even if you have these paragons of virtue there, like Noah, Daniel, and Job, it won't spare the city. So how much more the presence of a few righteous people in Jerusalem, how much more won't that spare a city that's as wicked as Jerusalem? He says, well, you know, come on. How much more do you think that's not going to work? A city that deserves multiple forms of judgment, sword, famine, wild animals, and disease. So don't let people fool you this way. You know, and I thought about this, whatever form it takes, the claim that one can sin without consequences is a lie. And it has many forms. It has many ways of sitting here and saying, listen, don't worry about that. You know, that's okay. Go ahead and sin. You're going to be protected. The city's protected. Why? Well, it's protected because there's a righteous guy here. Or, go ahead, you're with the right group of people. You see, you go ahead and sin, and, and don't you worry about the consequences. You live in defiance of the Almighty God, and you be at peace. I'm telling you, that's a lie. You want to be at peace, you need to fall down before the Almighty God. Fall down, tell Him, all that I have is yours. I hold nothing back from you. Heart, soul, mind, and strength I give to you. And don't let people sit and say, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. I know you can't do it perfectly, but you can set your heart and your mind and your intent. Okay? And you can pursue and get up and pursue and get up and get up. Completely different. Okay? Don't get into this idea, listen, here's the deal. I give you 90% of it, God, and I'm going to hold on to. I like getting high. I'm going to hold on to it. I like immoral sex. I'm going to hold on to it. I like whatever it is. I'm going to hold on to it. You're lying to yourself. And anybody that tells you that's okay is lying to you. Lying to you. And you think they're your friend and they're not. They're not. They're not telling you the truth. So he sits here and he says, look, don't fall for that. To vindicate his justice before the exiles, God says that he's going to spare some impenitent Jews from the city and he will bring them into exile and the exiles will then see firsthand why God destroyed the nation. You see that in verses 22 and 23. So the exiles, they're going to see that. I'm going to give you some living examples of the people who are over here in Jerusalem. I'll bring them in and let you have a look at them in exile. You can see them up close and personal. So you recognize what's going on. Then in chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, you have this thing about the vine that is burned. Okay, in chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Israel is often compared to a grapevine in the Old Testament. It was God's grapevine taken from Egypt and planted in the Promised Land. For instance, you can see that in Psalm chapter 80. Psalm 80 in verses 8 through 11, you can see that. 
But a vine is only good for one thing. The, the only thing a vine is good for is for producing grapes for its owner. As far as its wood goes, you're not building stuff out of vine wood. Okay, as far as, its woods, as far as the wood goes, it's not useful for anything but burning. And that doesn't change after it's been partially burned up. In other words, you sit here and say, well, as a whole thing, not partially burned up, it's useless except for burning. And then after you partially burn it up, it now doesn't become useful. Okay, it doesn't become useful by being partially burned up. So if a vine ceases to produce fruit, the only thing is to cut it down and burn it. Okay, it's to cut it down and burn it. And if it's partially burned up, which was speaking about Judah being figuratively burned up in the exile of 598 and 597 where Ezekiel went out. They'd already been judged. Partially burned up. So the only thing to do with what's left is to, is to burn it. And that's what he's talking about in that chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now, of course, in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17, Jesus humbly refers to himself as the vine, portraying himself as God's servant who produces what God desires. The fruit that God desires. That is Jesus Christ perfectly. Okay, he, he produces what God desires, and we, on the other hand, are the branches of that vine, and we must remain attached to that vine to bear the fruit God desires. You and I stay submitted to Jesus Christ. We, he is our Lord. What He wants, we want. What He says, we seek to do. We are attached to Him. And as we are attached to Him, submitted to Him, He, through us, produces fruit for God. He transforms us into his image, and we then yield fruit that is pleasing to God. We do things God wants. We are good people, noble people, helpful people, sacrificial people. We are blessing people's lives. We are sharing the gospel with people. You see, that is what, that is what happens. Now, if we cease to be attached to the vine, if we decide, say, listen, I'm out. This Christian stuff is weary. It wears me out. 24-7. You don't get a break. I want a sabbatical. I want out. And he says, you do that. You cut yourself off from that. And then you won't produce anything. And you won't produce any fruit. And for that lack of faith, you will then be discarded. For that turning loose, you will then not produce the fruit, which is a function of being attached, of being faithful, surrendered. You turn loose, you won't produce food, fruit, and you'll be discarded because of your lack of faith and trust and submission to Jesus Christ. So you have this, this picture of the vine. Ezekiel in chapter 16, this is a long chapter, and this is an allegory, okay? He tells this long story about Jerusalem's tragic life. He's going in chapter 16 about, about the, you know, the history of Jerusalem. Here it is on the verge of destruction. And he goes and he tells the story. He, says, he talks about, in verses 1 through 5, you know, he talks about finding the baby and this kind of thing. Well, Jerusalem, Jerusalem was founded by pagan peoples, the pagan peoples of Canaan, the Amorites and the Hittites. And you can see that in a number of places in Genesis, Numbers, Joshua, Amos. Okay, it's founded, Jerusalem, the city, is founded by the pagan peoples of Canaan, Amorites and Hittites. Yet for generations, it was neglected as a barely surviving city. Okay, it's their question, is the city going to survive? Jerusalem had a long history. Okay, so the sweep of this allegory is a vast one. He's talking about the history of Jerusalem that is ready to go down. And he says, Jerusalem, you know, it's founded by pagan peoples. And then in verses 6 and 7, but God determined that that struggling city, it would live. And at least by Abraham's time, Jerusalem had grown and developed into an independent city-state. Okay, you see that, for example, in, in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Then, in, the, then in, in verse 8 of this chapter, what he's depicting there, when he talks about this relationship with God and the city, is that following David's capture of the, of the fortified part of the city, he made it the nation's capital. He moved the ark there, and he prepared for construction of the temple. And Jerusalem, after that, it had a special status as God's chosen place. So here's this city that struggled for existence. God determined that it would live. Then he entered into a special relationship with this city. Then verses 9 through 14, he speaks there of the glory of Solomon's reign. 
For here the city is now, you know, it's decorated and it's just really wonderful. During Solomon's reign, God had made Jerusalem a magnificent city. It was a wonderful city. It was exceedingly wealthy and it was the site of God's beautiful temple. And the fame of Jerusalem, it spread throughout the world. It went from this thing that was teetering on extinction that God finds and loves and decides will live and has a special relationship with this city. He then glorifies this city. It is, you know, ornamented and it's just wonderful. And everybody hears about it. And they really are, you know, they, they wonder about this city and what a great city it is. Then in verse 15, you see, well, verse in 22, you can see that Jerusalem didn't remember that everything she had was a gift from God. Now, isn't that the story of humanity? Didn't remember that everything it had was a gift from God. God had given to Jerusalem. God had made this Jerusalem. Everything you have. Anything you have that is worth having that is good is a gift from God. And yet it's so easy for us because he blesses us so constantly to sit here and just, you know, forget that. Well, that's what happened to that city. And then you see in verse, in verse 15, instead of remembering that everything she had was a, was a gift from God, in verse 15 she became self-confident. And as the city became more famous, it became more cosmopolitan. You know, we've got all kinds of groups and people here. Uh, it began accommodating and embracing foreign gods, even to the point of offering child sacrifices. You see that in verses 16 through 21. Now look at this from God's side. Look at this from his perspective. He's telling them, you know, put my eyes on for a minute, will you? Look at how this is. I have rescued this city, blessed this city, loved this city, had a relationship with this city, and look how it treats me. Look how it treats me. Now, what, would, you know, what should we say to that? We ought to sit here and say it deserves to be destroyed. Look how it's treating the God who has given to it and loved it so much. Jerusalem multiplied its infidelity. You see this in verses 23 through 34. It multiplied its infidelity by pursuing spiritually illicit political relationships with Egypt, Assyria, and Babylonia. Rather than trust in the Lord for security, he says, you're mine. Rather than trust in the Lord for security, what do they do? They go running off after, say, listen, he's not going to do anything for us. He's not going to do anything for us. He can't, even if we're faithful, even if we're righteous, he won't do anything for us. We need the protection of the Egyptians. We need the protection of the Assyrians. We need the protection of the Babylonians. So he, they sold themselves, he says in those verses, 23 through 34, to foreign nations, and in doing so with the Assyrians and Babylonians particularly, that would involve submission to the gods of those nations. So they sell themselves there, and he says that you, Jerusalem was even worse than a whore. Worse than a whore because she paid to secure intimate relations. Okay? The prostitute's usually getting paid. And he says, here's Jerusalem out paying for these things. I mean, this is powerful. This is an indictment. God promises to judge Jerusalem for its flagrant infidelity. Its flagrant infidelity. And through the surrounding nations, he promises he's going to destroy the city and he's going to return it to the naked condition it was in when he first found it. He's going to reduce it to that. Strip it of all the glory with which he invested it and blessed it with. Just like an unfaithful wife, unfaithful wife, she will be humiliatingly executed. Okay, this is what he's saying here in this, in this allegory about the history of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's just like her mother, the pagan Hittites, and just like her sisters, Samaria and Sodom. He says, you're just like them, just, just like them. In fact, Jerusalem's sins have been so outrageous that she makes Samaria and Sodom appear righteous by comparison. Verses 44 through 52, makes them appear righteous by comparison. Now think about that. Makes them, makes them appear righteous. And you note that, it, you know, so here is paragons of wickedness. Samaria and Sodom. And he says, Jerusalem's so bad that they appear righteous by comparison. Then God stings Jerusalem by telling, telling her that he will change the fortune of Sodom and Samaria, he's going to do it by consoling them. Okay, they're off the scene. 
but he's going to console them, and the way he's going to do it is by changing Jerusalem's fortune, and he's going to change Jerusalem's fortune by destroying it and exiling its inhabitants. Okay, they're going to be restored to their former circumstances. Samaria and Sodom are going to be restored to their former circumstances, not literally. They're not going to be restored, and we see that that's not what's going to happen later on. But what he means, they will be restored to their former circumstances in that they will lose their distinction of wickedness. They're no longer the paragon of wickedness. Jerusalem's going to be. They're going to be put back to the place where they were before they had that distinction. They'll be restored to that place before they had that distinction of being supremely wicked. And then and God shows, that, as I said, he's not talking about this literally, but Jerusalem's going to be restored to its former circumstances in that it will again be naked and despised in verses 55 through 58. Okay, so this is what he's telling, this is he's telling Jerusalem its sweep and its history. But then he says, despite Israel's or Jerusalem's covenant disloyalty, he promises to remember his commitment to the Jewish people. Okay, he promises to remember his commitment to the Jewish people and to establish them a new everlasting covenant. Okay, and of course we know what this is pointing toward. He's going to do that. And Jerusalem will be elevated above all her sisters. And I can't help but think of the new Jerusalem in Revelation. See this idea of this, you know, Jerusalem. And of course the church, the church is Jewish at its root. Right? I mean, we are the new Israel, but we are the people who, you know, all the apostles are Jewish. The church is Jewish at its root, and we have been grafted into it. Okay, so we are grafted in. We are the people of God, having been grafted in as Gentiles, sharing the faith of Abraham. And so he sits here and he says, there's going to be glory in the future for Israel. Then in chapter 17, he tells this, this story about the two eagles, the cedar and the vine. Okay, and Ezekiel here, he delivers a riddle to them, to the house of Israel, and then he explains the riddle. Okay, and he explains the riddle, I think, really to show that, that to highlight Israel's lack of wisdom, that they're not going to be able to figure out the riddle. But he tells this riddle, he says, a great eagle takes the very top of a cedar of Lebanon, he takes it back to a land of merchants, and then the eagle plants seeds in the, in the land from which he took this, this top of this cedar, he plants a native seed there, and he puts it in very favorable circumstances. The seed that he planted there, it becomes an established vine. Okay, so we have this great eagle. He takes the top of, this, uh, top of the cedar of Lebanon, takes it back to a land of merchants, and then in that land here, he plants a seed that becomes, a, it becomes an established vine. But what does this vine do? This vine then turns its roots towards another great eagle, seeking water from that eagle rather than from the abundant water by which it was initially planted by the first eagle. It eschews that water and sits here and it turns over here and looks for water from this other eagle and the result of that is only withering and the ultimate destruction of that vine. Now verses 11 through 21 then explain this riddle and what it's about, it's about the diplomacy that's going on between the two exiles, the 10 or 12 years from 598, 597 B.C., to the coming exile of 587, 586, the complete destruction. During that period of time, diplomacy is going on, and what happened is Nebuchadnezzar, he took Judah's top leadership back to Babylon. You remember that? Okay, he takes their top leadership. We've got Ezekiel, we've got Jehoiakim, the royal family, and all that ex uh, exiled. And before that, we had Daniel. He takes the top leadership there, and he places Zedekiah, who's a descendant of David, he places him on the throne in Jerusalem as a puppet king. And for a while, Zedekiah, he was loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, he was there and he was loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. But eventually he got the idea of rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and he turned to Egypt. Okay, he turns to Egypt and looks for help. And that was suicide. Okay, that was suicide. Zedekiah's rebellion would be crushed and he himself would be exiled. And that's what he's telling about in, the, in this story. Now that ultimately was punishment for Zedekiah's rebellion against the Lord. And you see that in verse 19. So here's Zedekiah. He's put there as king. He continues to be wicked. And what happens? He turns to, he turns to Egypt and here's the story. And he's gonna, that's going to be his ruin. Because this alliance that he makes and this rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar is what immediately precipitates Nebuchadnezzar's assault and the destruction that is coming on Jerusalem. In verses 22 through 24, they speak of God's intention 
to install one of David's descendants as the Messiah, as the ideal ruler of Israel. So here we have a a messianic prophecy here where he speaks of his intention. He's going to put somebody there, one of David's descendants, who's going to be the ideal ruler, and it's going to be a kingdom of unparalleled splendor. And this is the kingdom of God that will be consummated when Jesus returns. The ideal place, the perfect reality, all of the glory, the immediate presence of God. And so he speaks about this in those verses. Now, chapter 18, I think I can do it. Chapter 18. Okay, you're familiar with this. This is a, this is a chapter that we appeal to a, a lot of times. But you have here the hardships that are coming on the land of Judah. They're being rationalized. They're being rationalized by a proverb that people say, look, the parents have eaten sour grapes and their children's teeth are set on edge. The parents ate the sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, rather than recognize that they were being punished for their own iniquity, rather than admit that, what they were doing is they were blaming the prior generation. They were just collateral damage. They weren't wicked. They didn't need to repent. They weren't being punished. They were simply receiving the fallout of punishment for their parents. And God sits here and says, you've got to knock that off. Because do you see what that does? That's just a way of throwing off conviction. As God is trying to convict them and get them to see, get them to look inside and say, yes, I'm the man. I'm guilty. I have been rebellious. I have been an idolater. I have not honored the Lord in my life. He's trying to get them to look in. And what are they doing? They've got a shield here that's blocking it and saying, no, it was my parents. I'm cool. My parents weren't. And so they got this shield, and he says, you've got to stop that. Because as long as you're doing that, as long as you're blocking the word that will come in and convict you of your sin, you will not repent. You will not repent. You have to be convicted to repent. You have to see. You know, it's when, when the story is told by Nathan to David, and he tells him that little parable, and he says, you're the man. You know, David gets all worked up and says, I, how dare that person who's, you know, taking that little lamb. And then he says, that dude is you. You're the guy. Ooh. Okay, that has to happen. See, then you see, oh, all right. Will I give it up now? You see, when I'm convicted of sin, now I'm in the valley of decision. Will I love it more than I love God? As long as I ward it off, I'm not in the valley of decision. Okay, so I have to be convicted. That puts me in the valley of decision. Will I repent? And then as I repent, I return to God. Okay, so here is this thing, and and he says, listen, you guys got to knock that off. He says, look, you have to stop it because it avoids guilt. And that gets around repentance. And the truth is that one generation is not condemned or punished for the sins of the other. Rather, judgment comes on the deserving. For instance, he says, if a man uh, does what is right, thereby indicating that he's a person of genuine faith, he will live, meaning he will not be condemned. If, on the other hand, his son is wicked... So he does what is right. He's a person of faith. He he will live. He will not be condemned. If, on the other hand, his son is wicked, the son will be condemned by God, regardless of his father's righteousness. He can't sit here and turn around and say, yes, I'm living in rebellion to you, but my dad was great. My dad was great. You know, I had a guy many years ago. I was trying to talk to him about the Lord, and I, I forget how I was trying to work into it. But his dodge to me was, he said, his sister was a Catholic. I said, you know, I don't quite see the relevance of that at a couple levels, but uh, anyway, that was, but he thought, see, that connection somehow was something, that his sister was a Catholic, and so that'd probably be close enough or something, I don't know, but he tells him, he says, listen, if in that situation you have a man, he does right, he, he will live, he says his son does wicked, he'll be condemned, and then again, if the grandson does right, he'll live regardless of his father's wickedness, righteous guy, wicked son, righteous grandson. Righteous man live, wicked grandson going to be judged, righteous grandson going to live regardless of his father's wickedness. So it's not, it's not passed down that way. See, justification and condemnation are not inherited. Now that doesn't mean that when God punishes a group that no righteous people will suffer. It means that when he does that and righteous people suffer, they're not being punished. 
I've used this example before, and it makes sense to me. For example, if you have, if you have husband and wife murderers who are exiled to a, an island, and children are born to them there, the children live there as the consequence of the parent's sin, but not as punishment for it. There is a distinction. You sit there and say, well, what difference does it make? They're living. Yes, they're living there, but they're not being punished for it. Okay? So the righteous who are there, who wind up suffering, it is not punishment for them. But that doesn't mean that no righteous people will suffer when judgment comes on this city. Okay? So they may suffer. It also doesn't mean that sin can affect only one generation. God visits the sin of one generation on another and that he allows harm, you know, sin to harm subsequent generations, and, and you're familiar with that. But one of the things I want, to, I, want to make point, I want to make here in the next five seconds, you see that environment is not omnipotent. Our culture tries to tell us that, listen, if you are raised, if you were abused as a, as a kid, then you'll be an abuser. If your dad was a drunk, you'll be a drunk, because you are simply this robot who functions on the environment, and that's it, and you can't escape it. Okay, I understand that influences happen. I understand that we can be bent and twisted in different ways. But don't fall into this idea that that somehow is a pass for me not being the person I am called to be. Your dad can be wicked and you can be righteous. Okay? Your dad can be wicked and you can be righteous. And your dad can be righteous and you can be wicked. So environment is not omnipotent, okay? We choose. We are human beings, okay? We're not little robots. We're not animals. We are human beings, and we choose to yield, surrender, to follow. And he makes that point there. I'll pick up there next week. Thank you.